So my last video I talked about calibrating my monitors. For this one I thought I'd talk a little bit more about why we need to calibrate monitors and a little bit about colour science. It is a complex and wide reaching thing which I don't fully understand but I know enough about it to get by in my job and hopefully enough about it to explain it a little bit to you. So essentially colour science is about how we ensure we've got accurate colours from the real world into print or digital or whatever we're doing with that colour. It can be something as simple as a photograph being printed or it can be as complex as making sure that uh, the same tins of paint all match each other. Essentially, in the real world, we have an almost infinite amount of colours which we're going to envision as a bar chart. These little dots represent all the different colours that are available. Obviously there's more than these three, but that's what I've got. Our eyes are only able to see a set amount of that total bar chart of colours. So these ones are not in the visible spectrum. Now it's not the same for everyone. You can have different variations of colour blindness. You might be one of the few people who are able to see beyond the normal amount. You might be someone who sees slightly less than a normal amount. Um, but essentially, there is a rough normative range of colours that we can see. So even though green is green, there's a lot of different variants of green, some of which we can't actually see. Now, when we have a camera, we assume it works the same as the human eye. But, once again, it has a very limited range of what it can see, which is less than the human eye in certain circumstances. Some cameras are designed to see these colours, some are designed to see these colours, but the typical digital camera that we use for photography and on our phones and such like are designed to use the human range of vision, but unfortunately it means we lose some more colours that the camera sensor can't pick up. Now this doesn't matter too much because the range it can pick up has got enough colours in it so that it will look pretty much accurate to life. So how does a camera do this? Inside the camera, the sensor is picking up light waves and it can identify the colours of those light waves, which we'll explain in a second, and it translates them into colours that are close to or near. So for example, this red is close to this red and it is within the colour range. This orange gets put in there and then this green, for example, can be transposed straight over because it is already within there we get some translation errors where this colour is not the same as this colour, it's as close as it can be, and the camera will take its best guess. So that best guess is determined by the camera's knowledge of all the visible colours available and where they sit within a diagram. That diagram is described as colour space, which is this kind of weird, like, kidney, squiggly shape, and it's also three-dimensional. I suppose it's like a block of cheese or something with the corners taken off. What that allows the camera to do and allows all steps of colour management to do is assign each colour a specific reference space within this chart and that is the X, Y, Z location. X, Y, Z location is three-dimensional space, works the same as a map. So it's just coordinates. So it might be 14, 15, minus 2 the minus two being the depth within that space. So it's a little bit complicated about how they determine that, but essentially all you need to know is a camera knows what it sees location, and because it knows its location, it can determine what the nearest neighbor is, what the closest color to that color is to assign it. And the reason why the camera has to do that is because if you remember back to the beginning, we can only see a certain amount of colors within all available colours and the camera can see less than that. So if a human can see roughly this much, a camera would only be able to see this much of the space. Depending on the type of camera, depending on the type of measurement that you're doing, whether it's a scientific £20,000 colorometer or it's your smartphone, this range will change. Um, it's down to the sensor essentially. The more you spend specifically on the colour accuracy of the sensor, the more it'll be able to see and the more accurate its guesses are. So essentially we are disregarding all this space up here. Now that doesn't really matter because again, 
these colours do exist in this smaller space. It's just that they don't have the exact colour which can be found up here. Now these XYZ coordinates, some of you may know them as RGB, which are the values of um, red, green and blue. You may know them as uh, HSL, which is hue, saturation and luminance. And you may also know them as CMYK or swap or a dozen other different um, types of keeping track of the specific colors available. The most common is RGB. Now we can know that as Adobe RGB or as S RGB. The difference being is that this is typically used for print and this is everything else. So that includes your phone, websites, TVs, you name it. sRGB is pretty much the standard color space. Now if you've got a really high end TV and you're watching a Hollywood film, the chances are that it's not in sRGB. It might be in, you know, something like BT 2020 or some variant. I think the other is 709, Rec 709. So there's a lot of different color spaces, but essentially all these color spaces are, are a slice of that piece of cheese and the colors within that, along with the translation layers, which allow cameras, monitors, printers, things like that to know which specific color is supposed to be displayed or recorded. So why then, if we know what colors are available to be photographed and we know what colors are available to be displayed and we know how to map them in a very precise way, why then do we need to calibrate all our equipment to ensure that the right color is recorded and the right color is displayed? Well, the simple answer is nothing that is 100% accurate. So knowing what we know about color space in that we've mapped all colors available. We know what is seen by human vision. We know that a camera is able to take a picture of a certain amount of that, which is enough to make it look realistic to what we're able to see. And knowing that the camera is able to locate those colors within that color space and assign it a number. In theory, going from camera to monitor to printer, those set values will never change. Every machine is able to display them and understand those numbers and it will come out perfectly. But as I said, not everything is 100% accurate. So when the camera takes a picture of a tree, this green dot means it's a tree, it will assign a number for the color green. Now, green is one of the hardest colors to photograph because there's so many variants of it and the sensors are not particularly brilliant at picking up greens. So it's gonna assume that that is, it's gonna assume that that green is in RGB 34, 139, 34. Those who really know their RGB colors will know that this is a forest green. So it makes sense that the tree is that color. However, and I've not checked this, so don't quote me. Let's say that this number corresponds to an XYZ, which is outside of the camera's capabilities. So what it's going to do is it's going to associate that number to a nearest neighbor, a closest one. It's going to squeeze it into what it's capable of doing. And now it's changed the number to 341935. This is just an example, but it could be more, it could be less of a change. But essentially one or two digits changes on each of them doesn't uh, result in a perceptible change in the color. So it's fine for the camera to do that because we wouldn't notice the difference. However, when you get larger drifts, especially when it drifts across all three of the RGB values, that's when you start to notice that it's no longer green and it's starting to go into the browns or it's starting to go into the yellows. Now, if we were to take this number and display it on this screen, uh, 139.35, that's assuming that that screen's 100% accurate and then we can send this to print 34.139.35. But as we know that nothing's 100% accurate, it turns out that this screen isn't able to display the full range of colors within the camera's capabilities. So it then translates that color into say 34, 1, 3, 9, 36, which now means that we are two points away from the original color. Even though we've not actually changed the image, it's getting further and further away because what we see on screen is what we will adapt and change to try and match that original color. So we might change it to 341393 because we're using our eyes and we've overcompensated and we've not realized that we've done that and we haven't got so far an empirical way of measuring it in there. So now when we send that to print, we're going to send it to print at 341393. So it's already wrong, but then the printer has to interpret that number again and within its capabilities assign another number and have another attempt at trying to match the original color. So this print coming out here may come out when we measure it at, one, at 34, 139, 36, because it's gone back 
the other way or it could be 30. Overall, each stage is fairly accurate. Each stage is maintaining the perceived colour. The problem is, is if you take this print and put it next to the tree, it no longer matches the colour. So how do we compensate for that and make sure that photographs that need to be colour accurate and other colour measurements what need to be colour accurate stay colour accurate throughout the whole process. Now again it's never going to be 100% perfect but we can do a pretty decent job of controlling that. So this first stage on a consumer and prosumer and lower level professional cameras what are designed for photographing people and events and the stuff what we imagine the for. We can do um, sensor adjustments in camera to make it more calibrated and there's a couple of different ways of doing that which we will talk about in a second but essentially you don't always want to start messing with the internal characteristics of the camera primarily because color accuracy depends on environment on lighting conditions so you can calibrate the camera to be more accurate under one set of lighting conditions but that may make it less accurate in a different set of lighting conditions now, if you're using the camera in a set position and that's all you ever do then it's well worth doing but for here we're going to do the calibration on the output rather than on the input so this bit is still going to stay the same it's going to measure it at 34 128 34 we have to accept that this color isn't actually this color but it's as close as we're going to get now we introduce a step here and that is the color checker that is this piece of card this is a small one you can get smaller ones you can get bigger ones you can get more colors but essentially this card has been printed with 24 specific colors which we know the values for now these have gone through this process of calibration so when they have been printed they have then been checked with um, spectrometers and other color measuring devices which are very 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 accurate to make sure that these prints are coming out as close as possible what that means is when we photograph it the software that we use along with this knows what the values should be for these squares and as it checks it it does a color check which a lot of people will be familiar with you can click on your screen and it'll tell you the color value when we color check it the software knows how to adjust the file which has been output from the camera to ensure that it is actually color accurate it does that by generating a profile and that profile basically has adjustments built into it so the color checker profile will say this camera in this situation is minus one on blue and that's because if you go back when we take the photograph it's 34 128 34 but when we output it, it's coming out at 34, 139, 35. So minus one blue takes it back to 34. That means that we are putting the correct file into the monitor for display. Now the monitor itself also needs this calibration. And the reason for that is monitors cover typically Adobe RGB for professional ones and S RGB for everything else. Now the monitor I use is 98.5 something percent accurate and 99.9% .9 accurate for those two color spaces. So that means when I put in this for L3413935 and when I tell it to take minus one blue, it is gonna show 3413934. Now that 0.1% may occasionally result in a 138, but anything less than 2% is not visible. So essentially, that minor change in the display is not going to be perceptually visible and when we go back to the chain what we're talking about is the stacking of them percentages and the fact that some monitors some printers some cameras can have much larger variances so for example my monitor is originally in the 800 pound mark so you're looking at less than two percent most people's monitors are around the 100 150 pound mark they are somewhere in the region of greater than 30 percent so they may only be around 70 percent of sRGB and basically nothing of Adobe RGB. So this is where a problem occurs in that you may have a really top end camera, you may have calibrated that camera. When it comes to displaying it on your monitor, you could have up to 30%, 40%, 50% variance in the color being displayed to what is actually being photographed. If you have a monitor somewhere in like the 500 pound mark, you think oh brilliant it's definitely going to be a better monitor typically they again are in the 30 percent variance mark and the reason is is around the 500 pound mark is they are trying to get to srgb accuracy but they're not necessarily designed for design or for photography or whatever it might be they could be gaming monitors they could just be a high-end office monitor it's not necessarily about the price 
it is about its use purpose and the features that you want and you give up in order to do that. So whilst this monitor is really, really good on color accuracy, I wouldn't use it for gaming because the refresh rate isn't high enough. The resolution is probably too high. It's missing a lot of gaming features. Whereas you would use it for photography and for office work because that's pretty much what it's designed for. Okay, so once we've done our color checker and we know about variances in monitors, we now want to calibrate the screen that we've got. So out of the box, my monitor was not that. It was probably around 94%. So the calibration gets us up to this almost perfect score. These monitors down here will benefit. They may become less than 25%. So it's definitely going to be better. It's not going to turn a 150 pound monitor into that and vice versa. Now to do that, we have a digital version of the spider checker chart you can have up to 1300 colors all coming up on screen one after the other and each one of them um, digital representations of color has a set and non specific value again going back to this so if every screen comes up on the screen the computer knows that it has sent the code 34128834 so when we use a sensor up against the screen this sensor will measure what is seen and should report back 34, 128, 34. Now, you can see there's a little sensor there, a little ambient light diffuser, and it just plugs in with USB. These are like 150 quid, and they, again, are not 100% accurate, but they are close enough for what we are working on. They will do the same as what taking a photograph of this will do. It will say the monitor is displaying 34, 138, 34. So we've corrected the camera image by telling the software to display this number with minus one. Now we need to tell the display the controls that we have over it. So brightness, uh, contrast, red, green, blue, all the different controls that are built into the monitor that the monitor needs to adjust on the green scale plus one, plus one to green. Now, normally monitor controls are down here. You will go in there, find the controls and add plus one to green. Nowadays with these USB sensors and uh, hardware calibration and software profiles and all that kind of thing. This can be done automatically. So you run the software, the software does all the measurements, works out all the corrections and will generate a profile that your computer will use or you can import into the monitor itself and that will make all these corrections. So we've gone from not being able to photograph this green because it doesn't exist according to the camera. So it guesses the next nearest one. This isn't perfect. So it needs a correction of 0.1 in blue, which we found from Color Checker, which is displayed on the screen, which isn't perfect because it's not showing enough green. So we need to adjust the monitor plus one on green. And then you've guessed it. That once we've done all that and we've done all our edits and we send it to print, the printer needs exactly the same thing. So again, using the tools that we've described before, the color checkers and the scanners and the spectrometers and all that kind of stuff you print off a copy of the color checker you use your sensor on that and it will generate another profile what will say plus one on red and then hopefully once we've gone through all that and we print off our picture of a tree there we go this green we know cannot definitely match this screen but it will be as close as possible once we've done all these corrections okay so that would probably a lot to take in and probably something you're not actually interested in but essentially what we're saying is there are colors in the world that we can all see which the camera can't so it's going to guess the best that it can it's going to translate them into something to be displayed on screen and then through the display we're going to make adjustments and edits and corrections and get that ready to print and each one of them steps is not 100% accurate. So we use something which is close to being accurate to adjust back to what it should be like. And the monitor calibration is all part of that because we adjust what is on the screen. So if that is highly inaccurate, we will make corrections to make it correct. But then when we come to print it, it will print incorrectly because we've overcompensated for errors that we couldn't see in the first place. Now. Those who know me as a photographer will probably go, oh, well, I've never seen you with one of them things. And the reason for that is I only use color checkers in areas where it's important that we get good accuracy. So that goes to product photography. So if someone is ordering a specific color of jeans or a plastic tub or wallpaper or a paint, something like that, they're buying it partially based on the color that it is. Obviously, they're going to pick fit and finish and all those other different things.
but when you order a pair of jeans and the blue you don't want them to turn up and for them to be navy you want them to be that specific color that you picked them to be now another place where i use it is in controlled environment portraits so that can be out in manchester it can be uh, in someone's office or home it could be here it can be in the studio anywhere where basically i, I have a set control over the lighting or the camera settings in order to achieve that lighting and that includes natural light where we're not taking photographs over several hours but over the course of like an hour i can do measurements at the beginning and they'll stay true pretty much for that hour and the reason for that is skin tones the way that camera sensors work is they are basically measuring the light what bounces off our skin and they are recording the light that bounces off our skin now because of the way different skin tones absorb light at different rates the camera will see different colors you tend to find that with caucasian skin cameras tend to produce a bit of a red kind of image because most of the light being bounced off our skin is bringing the color of blood with it so that you tend to get that very um, red pinkish kind of look to the skin tones and when you are uh, photographing people with darker skin tones you tend to get a very orange look to the skin which again is to do with the way that the light reflects off and instead of bringing like the color of blood in that reflection it tends to bring the color of the underlying layers of skin you get a lot of orange and yellow coming through a lot of people don't realize that that's not how we see black skin so the color checker is really useful for adjusting that darker skin tones definitely do benefit from having that calibration and i think it's something that's really important as well so that people are actually represented accurately however when it comes to photographing events especially outdoor events or ones that are a little bit more loosey-goosey and a little bit more unplanned you don't really have the opportunity to go around and photograph the color checker in every single spot every single lighting condition and essentially if you're in an environment which has daylight coming from one side and internal lights from the other side but they've also got disco lights coming from that way and the disco lights are purple and green and red if you make a calibration for one spot and say the daylight is overcast and there's a bright orange light here and a red one here that calibration will only work for that as soon as the sun comes out on that side someone turns off the internal light and now there's a green light coming this way the calibration will be all wrong and it will end up just messing the whole picture up also when you are working in them kind of events you don't have time to set something up and photograph it specifically you've got to get on with it so the cameras themselves are accurate enough that in non-color accurate important um, events and meetings and such like they will produce a really really good image and you can kind of forget about it you need to worry about your monitor and your printers still but essentially the camera is good enough now the camera itself doesn't really have its own characteristics i'll have frequent questions saying which camera brand is the best and some people will say canon is better for portrait some people will say sony is better for neutral looks and that nikon is better for landscapes essentially these are characteristics which are programmed into the color interpretation so if we go back to when we have the camera photographing the tree you have sony canon and nikon and each one will pick its own color so if it's 34 128 34 and that is a known value sony may say right we want that to be as close as possible so they've tuned their camera to interpret them colors as say slightly off which is the minus one that we needed but that's a very neutral look at that canon being more portrait oriented may say that it needs more red because that's typical for light skin portraiture that you have a bit more red in there to make it a bit more vibrant whereas nikon they may say right we want it to be more green so we're going to add into the green now the variances are a lot more complicated than this and a lot more drastic than this so that there is an actual physical difference um, between the images output by each brand but essentially they all use a very similar sensor it's just that the way that they program that sensor will determine what's output and what this is it's just brand identity canon wants to say that the best portrait sony wants to say that they're most neutral and nikon wants to say the best for landscape so they tune their sensors to output at them values and you might think well 
surely they should tune them to output the most accurate and most calibrated image. And yeah, I mean, we live in a digital world. We work with sensors now, we don't work with film. So, you know, film would change from roll to roll from when it was brand new to when it got a little bit older and depending on the chemicals. And it was a very physical based medium, which couldn't allow for this level of accuracy. But unfortunately, the vast majority of people buying cameras don't buy them specifically for the accuracy and calibration. They buy them for, is it most neutral? Is it better for portraits? Is it better for landscapes? And the answer is, they're all pretty much the same. Whichever feels better in your hand, whichever you've already got lenses for and batteries for, whichever one you feel most comfortable using the menus on, that's the camera to buy. The images themselves, once you've calibrated your monitors, once you've calibrated your image output, these will all get neutralized out to be in the same level anyway. And you can then put your own artistic interpretation onto that by manipulating these colors in the post-processing. There you go. I think that covers what I know about color science and how complex it is getting everything organized so that it's accurate enough that what we saw is what we see and what we intended in the edit is also what we see and getting rid of all those kind of weird and wonderful things in how it interacts with different skin tones, different materials and, and all that wonderfully interesting nonsense. Thanks.